the newest edition of the ZX seminar. Uh, today we have uh, Daniel Assets, who will be talking about uh, non-unitary non gates using measurements only. Uh, please, Daniel, take it away. Okay. So thank you, John, for the introduction and thanks for the invitation, and uh, both you and Sarah. And uh, I'll present today this uh, work about non-unitary gases or measurements only, which is also available on archive. So first, I want to give an outline for the talk. So I'll basically start from some introduction about graph states. It will be more like example. And then I'll go to measurement-based quantum computation, which is the more interesting parts. And then we will see how ZX Calculus actually solved many of this uh, problem and formalism. So it will help us actually to construct things analytically. And I'll present an example for non-unitary gates, including 2D examples. And then we'll go over to imaginary time evolution and uh, some other quantities. So let me start with uh, graph states. So what we usually do here is quantum computation. So there are many like uh, things to cover because I'm not sure. Uh, so to, to be sure that we are on, all on the same page. So usually what happens in quantum computation is that we have the uh, qubits here on the, let me go to laser pointer. So usually you have uh, four qubits. So this was generated with uh, IBM quantum experience, which I recommend for uh, everyone that wants to understand like a little bit of quantum computation and so on. And these qubits undergo some, so they are two uh, state level system and they undergo some kind of unitary uh, evolution, which we usually decompose as unitary gates, either what is called one qubit unitary gate, which is a linear transformation that acts on one qubit or two qubit gate, which acts on two qubits. Now, uh, usually I'll focus on this uh, Hadamard gate, which takes the zero state. So here is the block sphere. As you can see, we have this zero here and here is the plus state. So it takes you from the zero to the plus. Okay, so this is the, what is the important for us. And there is also this uh, control uh, X it is called, so this, uh, for example, flips. So overall, this type of uh, circuits, which is all the unitary gates combined, creates this entangled state, which is known as the GSZ state. Now, this state has entanglement. Entanglement is a property of quantum states, which actually descends from classical mixtures of, of things. So the important resources usually in the circuit model that you have the qubits, you act on them with unitary gates, and then at the end you apply measurements to actually get information. So here if we measure, for example, the first qubit, it may be zero or one. The moment that we measured it, all the other qubits will follow to be zero or one. So this is actually the process here. So just to give short uh, overview. Okay, now what we will focus is on graph states. So graph states are states that are created by first applying Hadamard gates on each qubit and then applied control Z gates. So control Z gates is if the first qubit is zero, we do nothing on the second qubit. And if it is one, we are applying a Z gate, which is a phase flip. So let me explain actually what is this state. So this is very famous graph states. This is known as the cluster state for four qubits. And what it creates is basically all a superposition of all possible strings. So here we get all possible strings, zeros, one, and so on. But some of them will have a phase. So instead of you know, zero, zero, plus zero, zero, one, plus uh, zero, zero, one, zero, and so on, some of them will have a pi phase, which gives us minus one. So this is what creates the interesting uh, structure that we usually have. And this is generally, so graph states can be created. It's not only this type of uh, graph. So take any graph that you want, have vertices on it, apply on them H gates, then apply control Z between them to create the entanglement. So this is the graph structure. So you see here, this is the usual uh, cycle graph. So you have four vertices and they are connected. You can have star graph, for example. So if we have a star graph, so here is an example, we have here a vertex, we connect it to three other vertices and we can follow the same protocol. And this will be a GSZ state 
um, till uh, local uh, unitaries. Okay, so it's not exactly the same, but it has like same properties. Now measurements on graph states were studied. So this is the important part. So X and Y measurements are well known to do some graph theory operations. So they're doing something that's called local complementation graph theory, but Z measurements usually just uh, disconnect the vertices. So they actually destroy information. So many times we will use this graph states to mediate information from, for example, one vertex to another. So to do that, instead of actually preparing it in the plus state via this uh, H gate, prepare it in some general state, and this Z measurements will actually destroy the information. So they are some sort of irreversible process, which we will see actually uh, maybe a you know, non-unitary gate. Okay, so this will be more clear uh, as we go on, but I just wanted a short overview. Uh, to understand what are actually all this type of uh, state that we are looking at. So we focus on graph states and so on. Now, what people found to do with this graph states is what is known as measurement-based quantum computation. So let me explain this via the very simple uh, here example. So here we created the graph states with five qubits. So this is known as the cluster states. Okay, so basically you take every qubit here, you apply Hadamard on it, and then you apply control Z between each pair here. So they are like connected here. So you get here a line. Okay, and then here you have an input. Okay, so this input, you may not start this state in the plus state, okay, as we usually create the graph state, but you actually start it with some a psi state. Okay, so choose any state that you want. This light circle indicates that this is an input. Measure qubits one, two, three, and four in the X basis. Then what actually people discovered, and uh, so this was due to Robert Hassendorf and collaborators, is that this thing will teleport your state from here to the last qubit. So you actually initiated here some uh, state psi you connected it to this cluster state on this four qubits, okay, via control Z. You measure them in the X and you teleported the input to, to the output, okay? This is very important. So this is doing some quantum information processing. Now, what we don't have here is we don't have gates. Why? Because you can actually start all this process via one large cluster state. So think that I have a cluster state via, for example, uh, I can have it uh, from some material or something that has this very interesting entangled uh, state. And then by just doing measurements on this state, I can create information, mediate the information and process the information. Okay, so the entanglement is what is used here. So as you measure, you destroy entanglement and you actually use it as a fuel to uh, process the information from the input to the output. Now, what people later found out, so it, it is in the same paper, but it's later pages, that you can actually do general rotation on this state. So if I have an input state and I measure in some rotated basis, okay, so instead of just doing a simple, uh, uh, you know, X measurements, I now measure in some rotated angles in the X, Y plane. So this is important. As I explained very briefly, Z measurements sort of destroy information. So you don't want to use them here. If I measure here something in the Z basis, I basically uh, you know, disconnect the chain from the left part to the right part. I lose this entangled connection. So if you, you want to mediate the information from one part to the other, you need to actually measure in the X, Y basis. So what people found out that you can do any rotation, one qubit rotation via this three Euler angles, they're like Euler angles. Now, a caveat here in MBQC is that this measurement results may not be deterministic, right? When I measure X here, I may get zero, I may get one. So people have protocols how to actually correct this. In the ZX calculus, it will be very clear how we see it. But basically when you measure an X here, you may add some kind of operation that you didn't want. So instead of doing teleportation, you may apply teleportation plus X or Z uh, gates, okay? 
So what is interesting about this cluster set is that if I have very big two-dimensional cluster sets, so don't think just one-dimensional chain, think something that is two-dimensional, I can have many inputs and many outputs. So I can do basically universal quantum computation just by doing this X and rotated angles measurements. So this was uh, discovered later by uh, Elze, in 2012, that the cluster state is some sort of universal resource, and of course, later by a Robert Tassendorf in 2017. Um, so universal resource means that I can do basically only by measurements on some very large state that has some kind of entanglement, a compu any co kind of computation that I want. So many people uh, very was very interested and intrigued by this opportunity. But what is missing here is that currently also this uh, kind of um, um, procedure allows you to do this kind of unitary gates. Uh, Non-unitary gates were not discussed. So my talk will be primarily to, to show how we can actually, by doing measurement in the XZ plane, apply this type of non-unitary uh, gates. So there will be some caveats also, but uh, I'll show it more uh, generally later. So how usually you try to prove such a thing? So I, I told you now many, many facts, but I didn't prove anything. So what is interesting here is you can start from a very simple example, three qubits. Then you can basically get a lot of equations. So I can get equation like this and like that. So you multiply a lot of um, uh, properties on, on this uh, state because you sort of know. And people worked out full theorems how you actually know what unitary gates acts here. So if you follow this theorem, you can prove that this type of protocol applies an identity gate. But as you see, this is very complicated. So can we do, a, can we find an easier method to actually show that this type of computation is doing an identity gate? So it actually teleports information. Okay, so this is where ZX calculus enters. So the ZX calculus is a very, very um, direct and helpful way to actually understand all this kind of computation. So uh, feel free to ask me any questions if uh, needed. So uh, I have a question. Could you go back to one yes. slide before? Yes. When you're performing this theorem, can I understand it as you are collapsing your state into the joint plus one eigenspace? of the measurement operator and then so so, so this theorem is, is is more complicated it tells you that if you don't have an input here you have here a plus state you can find some kind of relations like x1 x3 acting on this state equals this state or z1 z3 act on this state equals this state then it tells you that if you have this relations and they are here then it actually performs this U gate, which here is identity because I don't have anything that acts here on the X3. Okay, so th this is this type of uh, um, um, theorem. So it, it is it, it is some sort of complicated to apply. So you okay. need to know what kind of unitary gate you want and you find the equations, this kind of uh, complicated. Now, can I think of it as like your X1, X3 and Z1, Z3? are the stabilizers of your state. And yeah. then based on that, you you define the logical operator, which is your U. So if you just use the cluster state, you have stabilizers. Okay, I didn't show them. Um, but basically you have stabilizer, which is X and Z on all its neighbors. Okay, so you can multiply them. So here I multiply here X, Z and Z, X here. So the Z canceled on two, so I get X1, X3. So this is how you get the first equation. And the second equation is when you just multiply this stabilizer, but you measure this uh, second qubit in X. So you actually just show the result of the measurement here. So this is how you get the equation. This is correct. And this is how you get this unitary case. But uh, this theorem is sort of complicated to apply. So it, it is not that very direct. It doesn't give you U very easily. So this was the point here. Okay, okay thank you. So feel free to ask me any questions throughout the lecture.
Okay. And how ZX calculus will actually help us to understand this type of you know, measurements. So I have now very large graph states or cluster state, and I do many measurements. What kind of unitary gate, gate do I get, right? So, so this is a motivating question and a challenge for us. So this is where ZX calculus actually solves these things. So let me briefly describe, uh, though I know that uh, there are many experts here that know this ZX calculus. So there is something that is called a green spider, which for us will be a plus state. It may be the plus state, so it's conjugate, okay? It depends on the direction. And you have a red spider, which is the zero state. If it has only one, so it's like uh, this tensors that you have one leg, so it is a zero. And if you enter here, for example, a green spider, it will be plus and then zero in there. So it will be just inner product. Now you may have many uh, legs for the spiders, and then you have sort of uh, equations like this. So you may add alpha here to have a phase between them. You may not, of course. Okay, and also this uh, red spider, this are kind of a, uh, uh, projections more or less okay so it's not exactly i think but um you can actually so people uh pulled so this i think uh bob was the pioneer here um and collaborators of course and that's this kind of uh can span all the possible uh states that you have in quantum mechanics by doing diagrams like this with a lot of feathers, but you need some rules. So there are rules for the spiders. They cannot exist alone. So what are the rules? So I just present the rules that are relevant for us. So they are very simple. If you have two spiders, you can connect them and you have also definition. So it's not definition for the Hadamard gate, okay, that I showed you before, which is basically this type of thing. And you can calculate it by multiplying lots of uh, matrices, but you have some phases and things like that. Now, of course, many other uh, rules for ZX calculus, the, the rules are not complete, okay? So, but I will use mostly the rules. And I'll show you how you actually define measurements. So this is the last thing that uh, I didn't show yet, how you can define measurements. So we have the Adamard gate, we have initialization for uh, the plus state. And what we need is a control Z gate, of course. So control Z is actually this kind of thing, which many times you will see um, people show it as a dashed uh, blue line. So when I try to prepare the cluster state, I basically have here a... Um, this type of diagram. So I start from plus, 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 and I have control Z and control Z. And here I merge this uh, green spider. So you can think of having two green spider and this will be a little bit to the right, okay? But we did some kind of uh, compressing uh, here, okay? So now let's see the one line proof for teleportation. So if I measure in the X basis, I actually project here to the S pi. So basically it means that if I measure plus, I should have had a green spider, right? With zero phase. But if I measured minus, I need this uh, phase, okay? So, so this is the type of thing that you need here. And this is how you do the measurements. Now this S1 and S2, you don't know them in advance, but in the ZX calculus, we must actually insert them. So this is a problem for simulation. So when I do simulations, I have a problem to use ZX calculus here because S1 and S2 must be taken from some probability distribution, which changes all the time as you measure more and more qubits. So this is this can be problematic, but it will help us to understand why the input goes to the output through this kind of um, teleportation. So let's see. I now take this uh, green spider and I connect it. So I get here S1 pi. I do the same for the second line. I get S2 pi. And for the last line, you just have this uh, green spider. Now, green spider with input and output, you can work out this is identity. And I think this may be additional rule, okay? But uh, I'm not sure if you need it as a rule, so... Okay, but uh, trust me, this is what it is. And if you have had them out, and you have something that is a green spider, it actually changes it to a red spider, okay? So what we have here is S1 pi and S2 pi, but in red. Now, what this is actually a Z gate. So if you work out, um, um, if you have zero here, of course, this is nothing. 
if you have one here, so S1, you measure it to be one, this is the byproduct. This is the things that in MBQC we call them byproducts. These are just Pauli operators that enters the computation as you measure the wrong, so-called wrong result, okay? So if I measured zero, zero, then great, I did teleportation. If I measured one, zero, I did this, Z. If I measured zero, one, I did X. If I measured one, one, I did some sort of Y. Okay, because this is X times Z. So this is a one line proof for teleportation. So this is the byproduct. You can actually correct them later. So for example, do tomography on this output at the end, and then apply this X and Z according to the measurements. Okay. So this is a very nice and direct proof. I don't need to go to this type of linear algebra um, um, constructions and construct equation for the stabilizers. I can just apply this ZX calculus. Now, this is a very powerful tool because now I can add more measurements. So what happens, uh, for example, if I add a uh, just general X, Y measurements? So this is very, very hard to do with the original proof. So here I measured in some tilted uh, theta uh, in the X, Y plane. So this is the measurements. You can work out the, um, the algebra it would be zero plus e to the i phi one, which is actually this tilted uh, um, angle in the X, Y plane. And the algebra is completely the same. So I did here this thing, I did here this thing, but at the end I got additional phi in a red spider. Now, what is this phi in a red spider? This is actually this uh, type of e to the minus i phi over 2x, okay? So you, you can work it out and see that this is something like this, okay? And this is a rotation. So what happens here is that if I added this phi, I did the rotation from the input to the output. So this is a unitary gate. Now, this is a rotation in X. If you add another rotation, you can do rotation in Z and then rotation in X and Z uh, combined. And then you can do all the Euler angles and you can do all possible of 1D rotation sites. So this is this was part of the proof for the universality in one dimension, okay, for this uh, input output. But this is very simple in ZX calculus. This is just uh, one line. And this uh, was uh, known, I think, before, but it um, wasn't... Um, you know, well used, I think, this formalism. Okay, and now we can actually start to see the interesting part of what happens if I measure in the X, Z plane, okay? So why we would like to do that? So if you go away from unitary gates, you can first find physics, for example, out of equilibrium that have some uh, non-unitary nature. Uh, you may have computational methods that require non-unitary matrices. For example, I want to diagonalize some kind of a matrix. So I want to do computation of something like this, for example, block encodings or so on. So they will benefit from some sort of non-unitary gates. Okay, It will shorten the calculation. You can always do non-unitary gates as part of a large unitary space, but maybe it will be more beneficial. And uh, this is mostly the motivation here. So this is interesting from this type of generalization. Can we actually do this non-unitary gates directly? Okay. And what happens here is that as we did this uh, unitary gate, so I explained you why this is actually a very simple rotation, you may actually go to the XZ plane and see how you actually do this kind of uh, you know, tilted measurements in the XZ plane. So of course, you don't want to be very, very close to this Z. So I here use epsilon, okay? Epsilon means very, very small number, of course. So it means that I measure in a tilted angle near the XY plane. So I don't want to add too much non-unitarity to the system. I want only a little bit because if we add too much, we will have some very irreversible uh, processes, okay? So let's now see what happens if we change the measurements from the XY plane to the XZ plane, okay? So what happens here is that basically you just need to change your measurements. So this, all the changes in the uh, this uh, kind of uh, computation. So in previous methods, you had to change all the stabilizers and so on, and it was very complicated. And because of ZX calculus, we can actually do this very, very clearly and directly. So let's see. If I now write this, uh, you know, let's say I measured S1, S2, so I measure something like this. Now, how do you actually compute this? 
So what we did at the end is that we just decompose it to a sum of two diagrams, and then we sum them as matrices. Okay, if you do it, you actually get that, you get something like this. So this is S1, S2. So this is M, this is the non-unitary part. And this is some artifact because of uh, this uh, second uh, measurement. So this second measurement is, is just uh, adding this uh, X thing. And this M depends on the measurement. So if I measure zero, I get this type of non-unitary gate, okay? And if I measure one, I get this type of non-unitary gate. Now, A is some function of epsilon, okay? Um, so theta is pi over two minus uh, epsilon, and A is some function like cosine uh, epsilon divided by one minus sine epsilon. It, it is not very important, okay? Um, it may be uh, larger than one or more than one, so, so you need to do the algebra. And what you found out that you have two possibilities. This is the problem. So if I chose a non-unitary gate, I get two different uh, a gate, depends on the measurement result, which is non-deterministic. So this is the problem now, because I want to apply a deterministic non-unitary gate, but I can't, because I get two measurements, which depending on the measurements, I'll get two different gates and I may not be able to correct one. So this, we will see later how we can actually uh, may correct this. Okay, so this is the important part. If you do XZ plane measurements, you get this type of relations, which are actually non-unitary, okay? Because A here is not one, okay? It may be larger than one, smaller than one, and it's not unitary. okay. So, Let's show also that this ZX calculus is very powerful for uh, two d examples. So there is a, a, an excellent package for Python that can take very, very complicated ZX diagram and simplify them. Okay, so if I draw something like this and I convert it to uh, the ZX calculus. So here I start all the qubits in the plus state. I connect here control Z between any adjacent qubits. So here we'll have control Z, control Z, control Z, control Z. These are the inputs. So here you don't start with the plus. You start with some uh, state that you choose for this uh, qubit and this qubit. And here it's the only thing that you measure in a tilted angle. This type of thing gives you some sort of two qubit gate. Okay. This is uh, some sort of uh, E to the I and P, I think, uh, X1, X2. Okay. So it's some kind of multi-qubit uh, rotation, not exactly, but okay. Now, this was done just with a simple uh, um, computational tool. So I don't need to, you know, go over the diagram. You, you can do it. So you can just try this in as, as an exercise, just try all this type of, uh, you know, measurements and just combine them. But with this computational tool, you can, take very, very, very large diagrams and actually compute what you get from there. If this is, uh, of course, unitary, because this unitary diagrams have some sort of uh, easy simplification, so you can take one gate out uh, at a time from this kind of diagrams. Now, when you have non-unitary gates, then it turns out to be more complicated. So if I now change it to epsilon here, so this is a non-unitary gate in the exit plane, this is the simplification. This is what I get. Okay, now this this doesn't tell me a lot. Okay, so I don't know what what this is. Okay, but I can do simplification processes. Okay, I can just start combining things. So I take this, uh, you know, Hadamard gate and I connect this pi over two to here. So I get two pi. So they are actually cancel. And then I start to shift a lot of lines and so on. And I get at the end this kind of. Uh, um, Thing, which looks like a circuit to me because this green and uh, red thing is a control X, which is known as a control X gates in the uh, quantum computation. But this blob is not uh, well known. So I don't know what is this blob. So apparently this is the non-unitary nature. It is encoded on the second qubit. And what happens here um, when we did the computation that we figured out that this is actually some sort of uh, Let's see, okay. So this is some sort of uh, 
a control X with this blob, which is actually some kind of this case. So at the end, what you get here is some kind of projection. So this is like the imaginary time uh, of this uh, X, Y uh, plane diagram. So instead now, because we changed P to epsilon in the XZ, we got instead of E to the minus I like X1, X2, you get something like with no this, uh, like no I. So this is imaginary time. You can think it as evolution. So this project, so if epsilon here, for example, is, uh, you know, zero, so you get identity, this is uh, really easy. If it's really large, then you get this projection, right? So so this is kind of a, a play that happens here as epsilon is very small, things are more unitary. As epsilon is very large, things turn out to be non-unitary. Okay, the algebra is a little bit uh, complicated here, so let me just skip it. Okay, so what we understood is that non-unitary uh, is also non-deterministic because it depends on the measurements. Okay, if I have zero or if I have one, okay, I get I may get different things. Here I assume that I all, always measure zero. Okay, so this was because you have very large diagram, you cannot assume too much things. Um, so what do I do with this? Can I do better? So for example, I got one. I don't want. I want to get m zero, but I got m one. How do I fix it? Can I fix it actually? So we may use post-selection, right? We may say, okay, only if we measured zero, then uh, we are doing the correct computation, but this requires exponential resources because as you have more and more and more uh, non-unitary gates, you may need to post-select on more and more qubits and this actually goes exponentially. So how you actually um, do it, and this is something that we will see uh, at later slides. So the imaginary time evolution protocol is actually a very uh, interesting thing here. So, uh, okay, I'll explain it briefly. So what I have here is that I want to do this imaginary time evolution. So I just do this small M0. I do post-selection, okay? I assume that I want M0 and I choose very small epsilon. What the gate looks like is to E to the epsilon divided by two Z. So I can just apply very, very small tilts like that, and then drive this uh, state to the zero, okay? So this is like a very small uh, imaginary time evolution as, as you can do like usual time evolution, okay? This is like a totalization in the imaginary time, okay? So all state will go to zero except this one state, okay? Here because it doesn't have zero coefficient. So this is the protocol. And now what I get here is that I can have two different ways, okay? And they will require post-selection, but you need to correct this feed forward. So you either correct it or you just get rid of it by just removing the problematic parts, okay? So let me, this is just details. So I just want to show you the results here. So what I show here is what happened when we did it on actual real quantum computer. So I can create the state, do the measurements and do post-selection. If I use this uh, optimized scheme, I get this. If I try to fix this pi product, so you remember all this x to the power of something. So I try to fix them via this, uh, what is called dynamic circuit. So you measure something and then you apply something else, but this probably takes too much time. And then you lose coherence. When you lose coherence, you end up in a random state. So this is the problem in current quantum computer. Hopefully this NIST computer will get better as we go on, but this is a very nice curve. If we actually compare it to the simulator, you see that it is actually almost like the simulator. We also tried this noisy simulator that, uh, so IBM provides also noisy simulations that you can add noise to your simulation and see how they like mimics the hardware. So here you see that it seems here, to better here to, to work fine. Okay. So now how we can maximize and quantify this non-unitary nature. So what we can do is something like this. If I got this M0, okay. So this is a correct measurement. So great, I end up. If I got M1, I now try to kick the states twice the time to the correct direction. So it's like, so things like random walk, here. So you go to the wrong direction. So you now need to go twice to the uh, correct direction. But if I go uh, again to the wrong direction, I need now to multiply it by two again. So this is basically what happens here. What happens here is that each time I get exponentially more and more like I need to kick the state to the correct direction by exponentially more and more and more uh, you know, large uh, angles. And at the end, it starts to uh, you know, wrap around the circle and then it completely loses the direction. 
So this is what we show here. So you do epsilon one, if it is great, so you don't need this. If not, you need to continue like this and you create the cluster state as you go, as long as you want. So the problem is that at the end, you still have maximum probability. So if you try to kick it even many, many times, at the end, you end up at some plateau. Okay, so I can do five attempts like this. I get something like here a 0.83 if I type epsilon 0.2. If epsilon is very small, so very unitary, then you get something like, which is very, very large. And this is approximately one minus two epsilons. Okay, so this is an inherent problem in uh, this uh, non-unitary gate. Okay, the non-unitary gates are non-deterministic by nature. And there is a proof at the end why it is that, but I don't think that I left time. But let me just say that if you could use this uh, non-unitary gates deterministically, you can solve very complicated uh, NP complete problems. And then it's some, it is kind of against the substantial hypothesis in uh, computer science that uh, quantum computers probably cannot solve NP complete problems in polynomial time, which is quantum polynomial time, okay? So just for this. We also verified this type of uh, a protocol via reinforcement machine learning. So you can actually model everything here via machine learning and let the machine uh, learn how to do uh, the best uh, you know, protocol. So we let the computer choose the angles and it chooses, you know, it, it is doing like um, 50,000 rounds and it tries to learn from that what is the good angle to choose after uh, everything. And it actually arrived to the same results. So this is in our appendix. If you want to see how machine learning can help us actually uh, get these types of protocol. Okay, so um, now let me talk about how we quantify this non-unitary nature. So I showed you that I have a gate that I measured here, and here I measured in the ZX plane, something like this, and I have input and output. Okay, this is the usual diagram. Now, a question to ask here is how much N is unitary or non-unitary? So someone gives me, for example, some kind of measurements if a lot of angles, like P, and then it chooses epsilon, and then another angle. How much this total diagram is non-unitary? So here we used a notion that is called operator entanglement, which means that you take the eigenvalues of N with some normalizations, okay, which are called here mu i's. You just take minus log of this sum of mu i's, okay, to the fourth power. So if you take to the second power, you end up with some normalization things. So you need the fourth power. Now, how can we measure this kind of quantity? So apparently we found how we do it via um, so we some sort of reduce this problem. So instead of measuring this N, we measure something that is called Rene entanglement. And Rene entanglement was very famously studied. So you create a state where the coefficient of these states have the same, uh, like the Rene entanglement of this state is the same as this um, operator entanglement. Okay, so this is a very nice reduction where you take this operator entanglement and you reduce it to this usual Rene entanglement. And there are many, many ways to measure the Rene entanglement. So let me cover here some ways. So the swap test is very famous. And there is also Hamming formula and random tomography and all this type of uh, uh, things that I not get into too much, okay? So if epsilon is very small, so as we expect, we get something that is unitary. So unitary gives us log two, okay? Why it is log two, uh, so you need to work out the log and the sum, but basically it's sum of everything to the fourth power and to the second power it should be one. So it's one plus one, it is two. So minus log of uh, this, it gives you log two. And as you go to the very large epsilon, like epsilon pi over two, which is a Z measurements, then you lose everything, you get a projection. So in a projection, as you know, one eigenvalue will be one and all the other will be zero. So minus log of one is actually zero. So this is why you get your zero. Now, uh, some methods have very large standard deviations, so they may get negative values. Um, but uh, overall, they do kind of show this very nice uh, slope, how you get from a unitary to non-unitary, and this can be all verified on a quantum computer. So this is not something that you do simulation to, to understand. You can actually run it on a quantum computer. It is a fairly complicated circuit, so this is why we didn't do that, OK? 
okay? But if you do it on a real quantum computer, you can actually get this for general uh, measurement uh, base. So you just need two copies and you can do even with one copy. So random tomography is a way to just take one copy of your system and from the correlation of the measurements results, you can actually deduce the Rene entanglement and then the operator entanglement. Okay, so this is a very nice way to quantify the non-unitary unitary nature of this kind of um, operator. So you have general operator, you want to quantify how much it is unitary or non-unitary. This is the test that you want to use. Okay. Uh, sorry, I yes. have a question about this figure. Yes. So earlier you said the smaller the epsilon, the closer the operation it is to the unitary operation, right? Right. And then here, uh, if we look at uh, somewhere close to zero, and then we saw that all like swap tests, having formula, random tomography, they all have very small standard deviation and they're close to unitary. Could you interpret mm -hmm. this? Like, what does it mean? So the standard deviation, I think uh, it may be artifacts of some um, sampling things. So I, I wouldn't trust this uh, standard deviation of this random tomography because as you get to projections, the samples that you get, you may need the, uh, so, so, so you, you need to choose in this random tomography, either that you want to sample more unitaries. So you kind of choose unitaries at random, or you may want to choose more states. Okay, so for each unitary, you need to choose, you know, enough states to get a sample. So it may be because of that, because as you get to projection, sometimes you need actually more states and less unitaries or more units. So those are kind of things that very deviate because of uh, the sampling that you have. So, okay, so this is, so the standard deviation here is something that is probably due to something, but the swap test, I think it is very low. So if you look at the swap test, it is consistently very low. So this is because this test is not very, um, affected by this type of uh, you know fluctuations right? mm. so but but as you see as epsilon is small indeed we are very close to unitary okay mm. so you want to be somewhere here because as you go here you are less and less uh, deterministic as we see uh, as we saw previously the maximum probability that you can get that the operation will be uh, uh, performed is something like one minus two epsilon okay approximately okay so as epsilon is larger, then you have less and less uh, possibility to get the correct uh, operation. So you, you can always do post-selection, of course, okay? But post-selection is exponential at the end. So this is what we wanted to avoid. Okay, so um, I'll skip this proof, okay? I don't think uh, it is uh, very important. And if so, we are already 40 minutes, so. Let me go over this proof. And yes, uh, I want just to thank you for your attention. And this is just a summary. Um, okay, so now we have many questions like, what is the most efficient non-unitary gates for the number of qubits? So you may ask, I want to apply some non-unitary gates. Can you give me the MBQC diagram with the less qubits that you can find? Right, okay. Or what happens when the qubits are noisy? You may ask, okay, I know that I have some type of noise in the system. Is this non-unitary gates are more robust than the other methods where you have large blocks of unitary and you find non-unitary in them? And this is a very interesting for us is how to characterize this non-unitary computational power because eventually in the unitary case, people recognize that if you have um, phases of matter with certain properties, topological properties, they may be used to universal uh, um, unitary uh, gates, okay? So you may apply any unitary gates if you are in the phase of matter, such as uh, the topological phase of matter known as symmetry protected topological phase. So it may be interesting to ask what is this non-unitary computational power? So you only need to apply one non-unitary gate, so it may be ill-defined, but you know maybe we can find some interpretation like we found for the unitary case. So it is interesting we can get this computational power notion. Um, so thank you again for your attention. And if you have any questions, so feel free to ask. All right, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um...
people can thank our speaker using the Zoom clap emoji thingy. <laughs> All right, so do you have any questions? So can I um, ask, since this is essentially based on post selection, um, mm -hmm. do you mostly envision this as sort of giving an additional power boost to very near term quantum computers where um, you want to get as, mu as much computation possible out of a limited hardware? So then like having to do some post selections just to just to get like a uh, just to get a couple of good samples, like that's that's worth the uh, the trade off. Is that sort of the idea uh, how we should think about this? So I think people today may have a way to construct this kind of you know gadgets for certain computation. So let's assume that you want to do some non unitary computation, and you may have a way to generate many many states that are good for this computation. So you may be able to actually do this post selection very efficiently, maybe. Okay, it depends on actually this, you know, this procedure and how you create so many states. But there, there are works into generation of this type of cluster state or things like that, and there it may be beneficial. Um, so you may engineer a specific type of things for that. Um, now the post selection problem will always be there. Okay, so it actually depends on on you know on your exact non-unitary gates so at the end um it's just that for normal quantum computation where you need to maybe do this type of circuit a lot of times then maybe you don't have enough copies so if you have some kind of generators of many copies for like mbqc you can generate like million copies in one second and measure all of them okay so Right. So is this um like if if I take a protocol like magic state distillation where like on an offline basis I can prepare the state ahead of time, like there it doesn't matter if I have to post select because I'm just doing this all the time. Like that that would be if you could like make it cheaper to execute using non unitary gates, that would be like a benefit then. It is a good a good question. So Yeah, if, if you can distill this type of states very efficiently or something like that, this is definitely a, a beneficial. Um, so I'm not sure if you can use it directly, like you can use many copies to get higher probability. So, 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 so this is like an interesting question on its own. So it's kind of like as you do magic distillation, as you have like five T gates, you can take their fidelity a little bit higher. Or as you have like uh, other, uh, for example, this uh, um, graph state distillation where you have bipartite graph states and you distill them a little bit further and then you repeat it, then you get more and more. I'm not sure how this like, so here it's like, uh, so so at least naively, I just take many copies and one copy will be successful. Okay. Now the question how you distill them, you take many copies and you actually get higher and higher uh, probability to succeed. This is an interesting question. Yes, I'm not sure. So, so, so maybe you can create something like, like this. This is a very interesting question. Yes, thank you. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question about this um binary tree that you showed earlier, where okay. you uh do this random walk and then yes. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. um, what if one of your measurement is wrong, and then, then you you mistakenly go to the wrong branch, but you didn't know because you thought you were correct, and then you basically start from mm -hmm. there. All of your later decision no longer, uh, works because you started with the wrong, uh, measurement outcome. What should you do? Okay, so here of course you you assume that you have ideal uh, measurements, so. When you measured, you get the correct one. If you have some like readout error, like 5% readout error, let's assume that you get one instead of zero, so it was one, then you you have the large problem. So this is also a problem in the usual MBQC, right? So if you, you, you need to be very precise with measurements. The only way to mitigate it is to go to some kind of code or something maybe to construct, you know, more robust way to do these things. So a measurements, false measurements will not actually uh, completely destroy the, the protocol. So think about like three copies. 
So you measured all the copies, you get something, and you somehow know that if the majority of the copies give get, got you the correct result. So so you you may be you you may be able to build the protocol like this. But uh, yes, this is a, a major major problem. So all all kind of noise is a major problem here. So this work didn't actually uh, no uh, take the noise into account. So the coherence. So you know you may have many states, but the angle goes to dangerous regions where you may have less or more uh, noise. Right. Right. Um, um, I'm wondering since you're dealing with NISC, then the available physical qubits is between 50 and a few hundreds. Then if mm -hmm. you're doing this majority count approach, which is basically air correction, then the, re the, the number of logical qubits that you have is quite limited. Would you still be able to perform interesting operations or like interesting circuits? So here we don't do a fault tolerant MBQC. We don't use the logical ones. Right, we just use the physical ones. So, so there are schemes how to do, you know, uh, this measurement based in a fault tolerant way. But they are much, much more complicated than uh, what we have here. So, what we do here in the NISC era is that you can do post selection, which is the easiest. So, instead of going to the sponges, you just if you got zero, you go to the correct one. Great. So, if you have fifteen qubits and you do this kind of post selection, then you know, it is not very good. So you need to get many samples, but eventually if the, so so you, you need to do some computation at what limit the readout error really destroys the, the coherence of your resource, right? Because if I have like 15 qubits and I know that I have 10% readout error, then I have 10% that one goes to zero and flips or other one goes to zero and flips and so on. But here it's a, no logicals, it's just physical qubits all around because, uh, so how you do it fault tolerantly, this is a very uh, clever question. So, so you need to construct some kind of protocol here to do this kind of uh, logical operation. So there, there are uh, papers about this for the unitary case. For this case, I don't know. So I guess that you can do things in, in in this lines, how they, so usually what you would do, you would do some kind of uh, very complicated measurements, you know, and, and, and yeah, it is not very uh, easy like here. So you, you, you need to think about how you leverage it to the whole tolerant uh, level. Uh, but here in ISC, we basically run a quantum computer and hope for the best. So uh, you don't have uh, much uh, possibility yet. So, there are uh, some NIST computer that can maybe protect one logical qubits. Uh, we heard recently or things like that, or even more, but with less operation. But uh, th these are all circuit-based uh, kind of uh, ways to go to fault tolerance. So there are also ways with this MBQC. So basically you generate some kind of uh, state that you want and you have enough redundancy in this state so you can do things in the logical way. So this this was also described in a paper by Robert Rassendorf and collaborators, how you can actually take a 3D cluster state and get a fault tolerant uh, and this quantum computation out of it. But this is uh, one dimensional things. So if you since you need many more measurements and checks and things like that, and then you 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 get somehow this unitary uh, thing. So, can okay, I understand the answer is, uh, for the non-unitary operation, we do not yet have a flat tower protocol, but for the unitary ones, we do. And the second point is. If we want to have fault tolerant protocols, we need many more measurements, and we also need to prepare fault tolerant three D cluster state. Is this like a good summary, or like is did I miss anything? Mm -hmm. So, so for the unitary case, definitely you need this kind of three uh, D structures, and uh, yes, so this is for the unitary case. I don't know for the non unitary case because this is not non deterministic in nature. I don't know if you can like. So, so 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 
you know, it is like worth, worth researching. This is like future research, probably. Uh, yeah, I don't know how you can protect this, but definitely in the unitary case, it was well studied. So. Thank you. Um, I have another question, but I'll let other people ask. If okay. we have more time, I'll ask. Yeah, let's see. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Well, Sarah, I guess you uh, you can ask the question again if you want. Oh, thank you. So previously, you were saying that when you perform the non-unitary gate, you um you perform a gate in x y plane, and then you did a tilted angle. And then this gives you a non-unitary gate that is in the XZ plane. I'm wondering uh, if you look at some of the quantum computing platform, like superconducting uh, 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 ones, their RZ gate is like is very good. And, and you basically uh, can think of it as having no noise. Like this is my understanding. So I wonder why did you pick uh, like a non-unitary gate in, a XZ, in XZ plane? If you choose a on the computing platform, and based on the error nature of that platform, you can choose to perform non-unitary gates in the plane that is somehow by nature uh, like fault tolerant to uh, a, a one particular type of noise. Is this a reasonable uh, way to think about like how do you choose a non-unitary gate? I, I think this is uh... Yeah, th this is a beautiful insight, I think, that you have is that if I have some kind of protected uh, plane, so if I actually, you know, instead of just preparing this cluster state, you need to prepare some kind of another state, right, in some kind of different plane such that this, for example, will be the unitary ones and this will be the non-unitary one, so it will be perpendicular, I assume. So, um. Yeah, I, I assume that your insight is correct, yes. So, um, but you, you may need to change this type of uh, of scheme. So instead of preparing the cluster state, you need to go to some rotated cluster state or something like this. Yes, so if you know one axis is better than the other, so definitely you want to go to one where also you have good readout and so on. Yes. Thank you.